welcome back to season four of Sister Brunch, the podcast all about Black women and gender expansive people thriving in entertainment and media. Fourth season. Did you say fourth season? Yes, you did, Fanchon. That means there are over 30 amazing women thriving in film, TV, and media that you can listen to and you can learn from uh, and you can commiserate with and unify with. You can find all of our episodes at sisterbrunch.com. And as always, you can find us on Instagram at Sister Brunch Podcast. I am your host, Fanchon Cox, and today's guest is Megan Fillmore. Megan's a director of production at Paramount. She's also a film director, producer, and activist. Under the banner of her newly founded production company, Hudson Fillmore, she creates scripted and unscripted content that focuses on womanist, BIPOC, and queer people. When she's not busy being a multi-hyphenate queen, you can find her volunteering with LA Compost, Color of Change, or hanging out with her new nephew, Trey. Sisters, please help me welcome Megan Fillmore. Thank you very much. Um, I'm pleased to be here. My pronouns are she, her. Um, but I did like multi-hyphenate queen as well. For <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm like, I might take that on. I might take that on. <laughs> um, so, Megan, we always like to start off with your journey, sharing mm -hmm. how you got to this place. You can start as far back as you want, the day you were born or the day your parents were born. That might make a three-hour podcast but I don't mind because I, <laughs> I like you. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, as far back as you want to go, tell us how you got to become a filmmaker, a director, and also working at Paramount. My father always had two TVs, one for sports, one for movies um, or TV shows. So I would sit by my dad um, when my parents were married. And um, so they did get divorced when I was 10. But before that, um, I would sit by him and I would watch the movies and I watched Still Magnolias um, with Sally Field and Julia Roberts and um, when, and there's other women in there, but when um, Sally Fields was in the funeral scene and um, at the cemetery, I said, dad, I want to be the person that helps her do that. How do I do that? And he said, he showed me the credits. Now, as a little kid, I only watched the end credits because that's what he showed me. Who does me. that? Did you? No, I no, but, but I was sitting next to him. And so I watched it. He's watching sports, not paying attention to me. And then I see a UPM come up. So in my mind, I thought the UPM was that person. Not that they're not, but that's what I thought. So in my mind, it was always there. So before I was 10, that little nugget was there. Then fast forward later in high school, not only was I in math and science school, I also was very good at poetry. And so I was in arty scenes and I went to an art house in Columbus, Ohio, art house theater. And that was like the boom of Steven Soderbergh, Quentin Tarantino, Paul Thomas Anderson, and all these films were just being shown. So that was another thing that was like laid in me, these independent filmmakers and what that meant. So go off to Mount Holyoke College, all women's college, and um, I get consumed with the Black aesthetic of theater. And I get to meet legends. Um, I got to meet Ntozaki Shange through Robbie McCauley, who was my, my mentor. I got to meet August Wilson. I got to meet all of these people because oh she, goodness, you know, yes. yes. And so that is how I learned how to direct actors to organize them. I was her stage manager, um, Robbie McCauley's stage manager. Also, Susan Laurie Parks is one of my alums. The two times she came there while I was at Mount Holyoke, I worked with her. And so that was my foundation. And they both told me, you're a producer. Like, hands down, that is what your skill set is. I do know how to do other things, but it was like, that's what came up in me. But that UPM was still there because that's very simple for me. And so fast forwarding, um, I leave college um, and then I go to American Repertory Theater. I'm working there and some of my friends there all moved to LA. Um, I was in New York at the time and long story short, 9-11 happened, went back to Ohio, saved some money, take care of some family. And then I came out here. 
Wow. And, okay. mm-hmm. and with that great alumni association of Mount Holyoke, back in those days, you had to call and they would mail you out a big Rolodex of women. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I called like all 50 and two of them got together with me. Um, and two of them got together with me and one of them put me on sets. Um, and, yes. uh, uh-huh, immediately the other one taught me how to stay employed through what was called reality staff, but it actually is now staff me up, I believe. And so with those two avenues and other people that I talked to the phone were also helpful. They just didn't meet with me. So, um, which was, you know, which is different. So I try to do the same today, but basically I got my first scripted experience. Um, and then I got to see what a set was when I was around 28 years old. I worked on Hanalee Culpepper's first feature that, 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 that she did. I was, I was the PA Wrangler on her set and it just, set it up for me. I, I actually still I have just, the picture. Go ahead. I have to say, Holly, uh-huh. she, um, she, one of her first shorts was through the AFI directing workshop for women. And I was in that short. Awesome. <laughs> and, awesome, awesome. and by the way, we should just plug her. She, we have an episode with her. It was just as she had, I think she had finished post on directing Picard. So she's the flat, first black woman to direct a, a series, a, a Star Trek series, the pilot for a Star Trek series. Um, we love her. Oh my goodness. You, and and I, I just have to say, you are naming like all the sister brunch bucket list, right? Like all these incredible storytellers, black women storytellers. Black women and non-binary folks. So yes, keep 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 going. So you had the Rolodex, you had this alumni support, um, and how did that lead to your job at Paramount? Mm-hmm. It led to my job at Paramount because um, I had the reality staff um, background, meaning the reality TV that helped me get through the writer strike because um, um, I was able to with you know not be well-established, but stayed through the writer's track because of reality TV. I start working um, at then it was Viacom CBS. I was line producing The Hills New Beginning. So the the Hills, the people from The Hills that are now in their 30s, I was the LP of that show. And um, for my scripted background, I'm a um, UPM that's DGA eligible for Movies of the Week. They had an initiative to do BIPOC queer films, movies of the week initiative. So it made sense since I knew them. I knew them. They knew I was a good line producer, could follow the rules. But then I had worked at a couple other networks, NFL and um, YouTube originals. They knew that I could do the network stuff. So it was just a match made for me to to come in in, in that role. So that's how I am making my living today. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, I want to uh, step back a little bit and define the roles. So you talked about UPM. So I want to actually define UPM and even producer. So when Susan Laurie Park said to you, you're a producer, we know that producer can mean many things, right? Especially in Hollywood, you could like pick up the phone once and get a producer credit, right? So, um, and we know you run circles around those folks. So let's break down UPM, what it stands for, what it looks like, and then also line producer, some other things that you mentioned. So let's start with UPM. UPM, a unit production manager, um, is the person who manages the production. They are the people, they're um, the line producer, the person who um, manages the budget of the production would bring on to hire all the rest of the crew within the budget allotted. And also if it is a union film, make sure that all union rules are in place as you go forward. They typically work, um, through pre-production production, production, a little bit of wrap. They're typically not around for the post of it, but they are, um, sometimes not seen. (laughs) Sometimes they are seen a lot depending on the production. Um, sometimes I'm the one who just strictly budget tracks and make sure things are going well when it comes to the day-to-day, the call sheets, um, managing the production office, 
those sort of things. But there are some times that line, the line producer likes to do those duties. And then I would be the person actually interacting with department heads, talent, if there's some sort of contractual thing going on that I have to work with another producer on, meaning there's lots of different types of producers. Um, sometimes the UPM is also credited as a producer as well, because they are. They're also a member of the Directors Guild because they are considered a part of the directing team. Okay. They get uh -huh, for a DGA production, you get residuals. It is a very um, uh, respected production um, position is a very respected position by the DGA, which a lot of people don't understand when you're in a non-union sort of scene or reality TV. They don't understand that um, it kind of cannot happen without you. Uh, I, I, let, let's say that three, four times <laughs> happen without you, without these positions, right? Um, but but that's interesting. I thought that it would be Producers Guild, but it's direct, it's the DGA. UPMs are under the DGA. Interesting. Um, and then you talked about line producer. So line producer hires the UPM. Of course, this is f the beautiful thing about Megan, why I was excited to have her is she working on stuff with money. Let's be clear. Like, these are budgets, right? Um, so they have, you know, they have the budget. But so what does the line producer do when those two roles are are separate? The separated. Um, so the line, the line producer um, would come in and either take a budget that was already created or create a budget for the production. Um, and that person is an above the line position um, that um, works alongside the creative producers to make sure that the we have the funds to make the product, to make the show, to make the movie. A line producer also typically would have knowledge of unions. Um, they would have knowledge of what it takes labor-wise to create this and also the gear. Um, they also know a lot about post-production and finishing so um, that they can bring it to fruition and also say, oh, you really don't have enough money or you have enough money. Most, depending. mostly they say you don't have enough, enough money. money. Yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh. and, and so if you don't have enough money, um, the LP um, line, line producer, I say is the expectation manager to the creative vision. Oh, nice. That it's, I, I've, I've always thought of them and, and this short changes everything they do. I always think of a line producer as an accountant a create, but one who's creative, who knows the industry, like you said, knows the standards for what things cost. Um, and so th this is a great opportunity to say, I get a lot of, a lot of my mentees want to be, want to like make their first film or make a short. And, and, and I always ask them, what's your budget? And they're like, I don't know. How do I know? And I'm like, find a line producer. And by the way, there are black women line producers. One of the reasons why we wanted to have Megan on, right? Is uh, they exist. Um, and, and that is a person who knows what things cost. They know what, what locations can cost, right? Like to do your, to shoot it in Los Angeles versus shooting it in, in uh, New Mexico, right? Wherever you're going to be filming it. And then they know the cost of the actors. They know they have all all of that information. And I love that you talked about the potential for sometimes the UPM, the unit production manager is, is also the line producer. You could be one person on one production. And in that case, that person would see it all the way through the, like you said, the UPM, usually the job finishes after filming, Whereas the line producer is on still all the way through because they're still helping you with the budget for editing, which is such an important part of the process. And I say that because my husband's an editor. So I always say they, they're the most important people after the UPMs and the, <laughs> after the Megans. <laughs> um, awesome. Okay. So um, you also have your own production company, Hudson Fillmore. So can you talk about your company? I know that you've done a film recently. Uh, so tell us about the company and also your film, Domestication. <laughs> that I one. Love it. Oh, so I, I, I love it too. I cannot believe that um, the um, woman that I follow in that documentary, she just put us into some film festivals recently and... Um, we I met a distributor and when I made that it was not supposed to be on a big screen and basically um Kim came to me Kim Yi 
who is a woman, um, just, I, I can't even say all the things that she does. She's an artist. She's um, a feminist who was raised after the third wave of feminism. So it just, it just is. She just is who she is, even though she does go by all pronouns. Um, she was getting married and she married an ex-client. Okay, so but you let's talk about client of uh huh of her. She she's a dominatrix. There you go. Okay, so good. one of hence, her clients hence the domestication, right? Domestication, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and so she basically because she knew that I worked in reality TV through some artist friends of mine, and um, I told her, I, yeah, I had I've done many weddings on TV, and um, she wanted me to direct and produce basically a bridezilla. She thought she could do a bridezilla, but as I got to know her. I realized the conflict was in her a lot uh, around a lot of her um, first generation trauma, Chinese American. She came here when she was about five and her parents got divorced at that time and how that affected who she was. Um, And she kind of rebelled against the quote unquote good Chinese girl. And she did everything in opposition of that. And, um, and also, and when I say opposition, meaning that, standard of perfection that um, I learned that a lot of mainland China parents try to put in their parent um, in there in their children. And um, so the documentary talks about that and what I found through the journey of that documentary, um, because it could, it was not a Bryzellus that that just wouldn't work um, because she chose the perfect partner for her. So her rebelling against her parents gave her parents so much joy to have her do a very traditional thing marrying, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, a cis white man. It just seemed, you know, but behind the scenes, you know, like when they got married, she had a key to his chastity belt. So, um, you know, <laughs> and like the parents were all there at the wedding. This, 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 this was open. It, was, it wasn't hidden, you know, and, and the doc is not about her sex work. It's about her journey as a woman still keeping her power while marrying the love of her life. So, um, yeah, it was, um, very unexpected, um, that it turned out that way. Um, and we start shooting that in 2019. Um, they now have a child, wow. um, part two, you so, know, so part two is <laughs> yeah. coming. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're definitely going to work. Um, I have found a lot of challenges, um, which I haven't got to discuss with you, um, for us to screen it with me being a, um, black woman. It was hard for me to get it into festivals because it's a Chinese American story. I thought it was a sex work, but when I would talk to these festival um, people, they would say it's because we want to showcase movies made by Asian people. And I'm like, but Kim is a producer, you know? And so, but it was, it was, it was very difficult. And I was only able to get it in one festival without pulling strings. I do have friends that could pull strings, but um, I also am very aware of taking space. Uh, You know what I'm saying? Because there are Black females directors that are killing it. And the Asian space in the United States is just, it can't even compare, you know, to what Black. So I was very, you know, aware of that. And I didn't want to take too much space up um, or try to get rules bent. But it does hurt me because that that particular documentary, when um, immigrant children, Asian people see it, their response is like, oh my God, you told my story. And they don't even think about the sex work, which is the most amazing part about the documentary. This is Sister Brunch, the podcast by and about Black women and gender expansive people thriving in entertainment and media. Keep listening for more of our conversation with our guest and producer extraordinaire, Megan Fillmore. And also while you're at it, go ahead and do us the big, big favor of sharing the show, giving us a review, a positive one that is, like 5, 10, 15 stars, wherever you're reviewing, and uh, leave that review on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, and follow us on the socials. We're on Instagram at Sister Brunch Podcast. And now here we are back with Megan Fillmore. We're in the finishing stages of a project. Um, I, I believe you 
were connected the climate summit um with sean dasani for agents of change yes. i'm a producer yeah I'm a, I'm a producer on that movie so is this a doc feature tell us more oh it is it is it is it's not a doc it's actually a scripted um spy um short that um sean wants to make a feature out of so we're trying to get it in people's faces that um are interested in um climate stories and we just have spies going around the world now we decided to hire a um, majority all trans cast and we have a trans yes. director yes. but that that is just that's just because we could <laughs> it's, it's, it's not because we had to or the story involves trans people and that's what i think is is, is lovely and beautiful because like when they, they approached me to help them with the project i said I'm just bisexual. Is that okay? <laughs> they, they, they were like, oh no, we're not just looking for people. I said, cause I was just looking at everybody's backgrounds. And so um, I was able to do help them produce that at the beginning of the year. And now we're at the finishing stages. And so when you ask about what Hudson Fillmore is going, um, my, um, my goal this year is I will be, um, there's two scripted um, shorts that I will finish outside of my day job projects. Um, next year, I'll be directing my own narrative sh um, short. And 23, I'm really looking for financiers so that in whatever happens in 2024, um, I am looking to um, become a seller again of product full, you know, full time. That's my that's that's my aim. That's my goal. Um, I love making content. Um, but right now I'm getting to, you know, I'm producing a movie with Will Packer. Um, I just did a Christmas movie with Idris Elba's company, Green Door, and, you know, at work. And um, those kind of connections are what I'm learning because for various reasons, it was hard for me to break in um, the industry as a line producer. And speaking of George Floyd, it was George Floyd that the doors just came down. They were like, oh, we need you. We need you. We need you now. So, um, you know, I had all this knowledge and didn't get properly paid for it. And now I can get paid for it. And I'm hoping to go back out there, use all this knowledge that I have with the connections that I've made to make the type of stories that I want that um, people who don't typically get a voice, I would like to give them a voice because that's what movies did for me growing up, I would get to hear stories um, and see certain nuggets of life that I just didn't know existed. And um, so that's, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. And, and that, the activism, the storytelling, the skills that I have, um, that's what Hudson Fillmore is. So... I got chills. You know that you know that's what Trujillo is all about. So you know we're gonna be mm -hmm. doing some co-pros. Are you comfortable talking about salary ranges? Because that's something we we ask our guests to do so that our listeners really have a sense of we we want y'all sisters listening to know this is something you can do. As Megan said, she saw that scene, <laughs> you know, watching the credits, which I love, by the way. First of all, we should say to everybody stay for the credits, not, not only to give, you know, to give gratitude to the people who worked hard on it, whose names you should know, right? Like you just, you don't know those names and you should, because they've worked the hardest on the, on the things you're seeing. The celebrities were hanging out in their trailers most of the time, always stay for the credits, both to, you know, give, give that love to, to those who did the work, but also to learn what, people's roles are? What are all the roles available to you? So um, on that note, Megan, can you talk about credit ranges, sal uh, sorry, salary ranges for UPMs, for line producers, for you as an independent producer? Well, this is, it is, it's very interesting when you do talk about salary. For me, what I, what I've learned, and it's been hard being um, as marginalized as I've been in society to actually fight for getting a rate. What I would ask anyone when you're looking for a job, talk to your white male counterparts about what what would you get in this? The the nice ones, the uh, anti-racist, yeah. non-patriarchal. Well, you know, and, and, yes, and even, yes. even if the patriarchal ones are willing to help you, True. those you'll the, take you, it. Uh-huh. And because as as a line producer, I learned that no matter what, 
it was the white cis men that always said, I want more. They always did. And that is something we all should do. So when it comes to UPMs, there are um, there are rate sheets that you can go on the DGA website and see what region you are in to see the scale, the basic level um, of of what of what you should get, and that right there can help you. Um, what what I like, um, and it depends on if it's a UPM gig for a year, what sort of support staff you have, because there are some UPM jobs where you're actually the LP as well. LP is line producer. Yes, yep. <laughs> Just to make sure. those 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 rates should definitely be around between five to 4,000 a week starting depending on how much it is and depending on the type of production um, that it will be. Because if there is a documentary, for example, where um, you're following a civil rights activist and it's not, um, you know, it may be grant funded, but you're only working on that one day a week max, you would lower your rate. But if it's a full-time job, four, four to five um, for a freelance gig seems very, very reasonable for, for that knowledge. Um, and um, But for your actual salaries that you're going, even for independent productions that are non-union, still use that scale rate sheet because what I find in non-union productions, you still have to do the same duties, even a little more difficult because you have to fight for a union format on a show so that you stay within budget, you know, you, 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 you stay within, um, parity for your crew, which is a lot of time you, you know, you have to, but those, those scale, um, sheets are out there all over the place. They normally change around February of the next year. Entertainment partners, um, they have a guidebook, um, and it costs like twenty two dollars that that you can get that can just give you those rates. So even if you're not a line producer, a UPM, you can look at a first AD rate, second AD, produ- um, production designer on down. You can just look across the board and get get those numbers for yourselves. But I also would implore you to talk because when I I want to be an SVP um, of production for someone like um, True Jalil, you know, Charles, for Charles someone D. King. Like- yes, or you. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, 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 <laughs> exactly. And so what, what I have found for those um, companies, 300,000 is the lowest when I talk to my white counterparts. But when I also talk to sisters, my Latina sisters, that's not what we're getting paid. I'm not getting that. You know what I'm saying, um, and I, I have I have not gotten to meet yet the Asian women in my group, and you know that. Um, but I, 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 you know, so when I see that, I'm like, oh. And then I also I have some male mentors that I have that I talk to and say, I'm going up for this. How much should I get? Um, also, a, another thing with rates too, which makes it um, um, helpful, especially if you're a UPM and LP right now. Um, they're kind of um, at a shortage. So you can use Staff Me Up to get another um, job offer. Um, I did that actually with Paramount. I got another job offer. So I used that so that they would raise yeah, me up. And I negotiate. learned that. Uh huh. And I learned that from my white male counterparts. So, so I don't want to limit anyone, especially in this, this age, that they understand. Um, I think Trevor Noah said it best listen to us. Listen to sure us. Sure did. He you know sure what I mean? And, and I'm summarizing the beautiful things that he say, but I mean, there's just so many um, nuggets that we have. We have evidence over after evidence after evidence, v- from voting <laughs> to running the, the industry right. Listen to Black mm-hmm. women. Like that, it's just... Um, yes, yes, yes. Oh, see, this is the problem because I want to go on for an hour. Okay. What are the skills needed to become? So when they, like when, when your um, mentors recognize that you were a producer outside of the kind of, of course, the kind of creative, the networking, the, those things, but what are the kind of like hard skills you need to become a UPM? I think you need to be very observational. Your ego has to hit the the road. So if you're a person who needs ego, you need um, like ego um, inflation. This is not the position, but you do need to be able to look at the project from every angle so that you can understand what a real complaint is 
versus just the creative or head of department asking for more because every department always asks for more. When you can do that, that really helps. Also, someone that I, that one of the things I like, and I think that I'm a decent UPM is I worked my way up. So I got to see different positions and I get to understand where they're coming from. You know, I worked in accounting. I worked in um, the art department. I um, learned gear very well in, re in reality TV. So I understand what it takes for camera gear to be secured properly, um, the what what the electricians are up against, you know, the grips are so that I can explain to the creatives, you have a scene that is going to, to actually shoot it is going to take an X number of setups. We don't have the money or the time. So how do we accomplish this without? And that that is a skill set you get from being observational. Um, the other thing is that I've had to learn is to, I'm not a schmoozer. <laughs> I'm not a schmoozer at all. I um, can help you with that I, one. <laughs> I, I love it. You might, you might have guessed. I can help you with that one. You can't. We go, we're, we're definitely going to have to talk. Because I always said, if I, ever, if, I, if I ever ran a company, I would not be the one to, because um, if you say that to a creative, they're like, oh my God, she's trying to change my vision. I'm not. So what, what I've had to learn, and I have done um, therapy courses about how to lessen my bluntness, if that, if that makes any sense, to have nuance to who I say I cannot do this to um, and say, how about doing it like this? Or is there another way we could get this done? So you UPMs being very unaware of who they're speaking to. And having that sort of tact because you could have someone, a creative just totally blow you up. Oh, she says no. That is one of, one, one of the main skill sets to be self-aware and realize that our main skill of seeing problems head on, trying to stop them happening, we cannot articulate that back to our creative counterparts majority of the time. It's so interesting. A lot of my job deals with numbers. I'm not great with numbers. Even though I went to math and science school, you do not have to be great with numbers, but you do have to learn how to look at numbers comprehensively. If you can look at a graph, see, you know, just any, any, any sort or COVID, this is perfect because all of us have looked, looked at these COVID graphs over and over. If you can look at the COVID graphs and you can see when it might not be the best time for you to interact with someone who has immune system problems, then you can be a UPM because you will be able to look at a budget, look at a budget tracker, look at a cost report um, or hot cost and be able to assist the greater whole with that information. You have other, other technicians, other um, wonderful skilled people who can help you with the numbers can help you calculate. And there's so much software out there today, you know, too. Um, so that's, that's, that's what I found, but those, those are the things. And um, I try to treat people like, not that I'm their mother, but I um, do approach people as, as a UPM and it helps me not um, to stay approachable. <laughs> you know or what you I mean? don't like them, Or you don't like them. Um, well, Fanchin, I don't really like anyone, but that's not, you know, but, but I, I, I think, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. But, 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 but I, I think that's because I'm a true introvert and I love my time to recharge. But when I, in, when I engage with people, I do. And like, I love one-on-ones with people, but when you have 160 people all day long, even if it's my best friend, I need a minute. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> Hey, it's Fanchon Cox, and you are listening to Sister Brunch. We will be right back. And now during this really quick break, go ahead and uh, head over to Instagram and follow us at Sister Brunch Podcast. This is Megan Latrice Fillmore, and you're listening to Sister Brunch, a podcast all about Black women and gender expansive people thriving in entertainment and media. How, where can we find you? Where can our listeners find you and support your work? Well, I have a website that I created, meganfillmore.com. And um, I have a wonderful woman named Portia who helps me outside of my day job, just keep it up. And we're about to do a revamp. 
of it to just to just add some of the new things that have happened. So that is a great place. I also um, have my um, Instagram, which has a lot of my stuff outside of work, like my activism work, not only um, the projects that I do in work and and personally at um, Feeling More of Meg, which is a play on, play on the spelling of my name, Feeling, F-E-E-L-I-N-G, um, more, M-O-R-E, of M-A-E-G. Sounds like a lot now, but once you see it, and my name is May- Megan Fillmore, because I always have to spell it for everyone. All three of my names, I have to spell them. So when, when, when you see it, you'll you'll understand. <laughs> and and it is a wonderful account to follow, because you'll be all over the world, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> and it's intersectional. I have to go back to that. I love that, you know, I find we get siloed, and and, and that was on purpose, right? We've been intentionally siloed. So like black folks stick, stick with black folks, right? And and to see that you, I, I hope your film plays in AAPI festivals and in black festivals and in just people festivals, right? Like, because you are an example of what we need to do, which is ultimately if we band together, <laughs> you know, that's how we get to liberation, right? We can't do that in our silos. So I love that about your work and about following all that you're doing. Okay, final question. So Megan, you are sitting down to a lovely sister brunch with young Megan. And we wanna know what are you both eating? What are you drinking? And what do you tell young Megan? When I think of young Megan, I'm going to think of Megan with relaxed hair at like the age of like 10 to 11. And I mean, I was like five, four. So (laughs) I was, I was, I was, uh, that was pretty, I was very similar. And um, she was having either high C or Tahitian treat, which was very popular in Ohio. And she had a little bit of vegetables on her plate, but she had some sort of fried pork and um, bread of some sort. Very, very Midwestern meal. Myself these days, um, I do not eat meat. Um, I'm a vegetarian and I desperately try to stay away from dairy um, at all costs. Eggs may come in, but I really try to stay away from dairy and hope to be vegan one day. And I love me some mocktails. Um, Ritual has come out with a great um, zero alcohol line of beverages and they have a great gin. So I love a good gin, gin and tonic with lime. It's so, so lovely. Um, and I love, love, love mocktail oxtails that I found at this place called Div- Divine Plant-Based Cuisine in Georgia. And it, it's lovely. So I would have me a full on Jamaican vegan meal sitting, 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 sitting with young Megan. And I basically would tell her, the importance of exercise so that you can do all that your heart desires and to be yourself. I hid from myself for years, you know, and um, I think being myself is really important and say, it's okay. You're actually not that dark skin. I always thought I was super dark. I thought I was super overweight. I was never super anything. I was just always Megan. I was going to say super, super woman. <laughs> I have to sleep and rest, but long story short, that, 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 that will be my sister brunch with that little Megan in Columbus, Ohio. And, you know, and tell her that even though it feels like no one is in your corner, I had a death in my family this, um, in, I should say in my family of friends back in Ohio and we all came together. And even though I'm bisexual, um, I have secular religious views, which are very different than my friends back home. I also do have a very diverse group of loved ones that I call family. Um, which all of my Black girlfriends came to me and they're very religious and they, they supported me. And, um, you know, um, I, I don't want to discount my white best friend, Chelsea, because she, she was there too. She's always rolled, rolled with me, but it was just such a lovely group. And they said, Megan, we always support everything you do out there. You know, we know it has to be hard that you were the only one who left, you know, to come this far, you know. And um, so I would just tell that little girl who always thought she didn't have people in her 
corner and that she was so different because, you know, I always had an Asian friend or Yugoslavian friend and they would be like, you think you're white and you think you, I am Megan Latrice Fillmore. That's it. And I want everyone else to be able to be the Mimi, the Fanchin, the, the, of, of who they are. It's so important. That's that. That's what. And I also would show her my birthday, my birthday photo shoot. I took a shoot in all gold glitter, <laughs> and I and I and I and I in all gold glitter because I've gained a little weight um, this past year. And I said, but this is still my body, and I still get to do all these wonderful things. And so um, I would just show that little girl those pictures. Just say, this is what you have to look forward to. Megan, thank you so much for coming on Sister Brunch. We appreciate you so much. Uh, we can't wait to share this with our listeners. You're inspiring. You're out there. Hire her if she available. And thank you. Truly, thank you. Well, thank you. I feel honored to be amongst so many wonderful women because um, still I still have that imposter syndrome. Like, am I allowed to be this cool and be this great? And I'm like, I guess I am. <laughs> you are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to Sister Brunch, the podcast that brings you the stories of Black women and gender expansive people breaking barriers and bringing joy to entertainment and media. This is our fourth season of Sister Brunch. You can find the transcript of this show and all our previous episodes at sisterbrunch.com. We appreciate our listeners and are so grateful for all of your support. Also remember to subscribe to our podcast. If you haven't done that already, leave us a great review and share it with other people. You can also follow and interact with us on Instagram at Sister Brunch Podcast. We so look forward to connecting with you. Sister Brunch is brought to you by Trujillo Productions. Our senior producer is Sonata Lee Narciss. Our co-producer is Brittany Turner. Our executive producers are Christabel and Sia Bwadi and Anya Adams. Our associate producers are Farida Abdul-Wahab and Mimi Slater. We acknowledge that the land we record our podcast on is the original land of the Tongva and the Chumash people. See you all next time. Until then, take really good care. <laughs>